Chat with Traders, episode 158, is brought to you by NAME, the National Association of Active Investment Managers. As you'll recall, I first mentioned NAME's Shark Tank Strategy Competition back in November. Well, time is ticking and the application due date is coming up fast. This is an opportunity to pitch your strategy and win meetings with six real money allocators. For everything you need to know, visit name.org slash traders. That's N-A-A-I-M dot org slash traders. Entries close March 1st. Markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Sup? What's happening, team? Episode 158. My name is Aaron Fifield. Let's get into it. The trader who you're soon to hear from is Phil Godecker, though some of you may know him better by his Twitter handle, at Ozark Trades. Phil's been trading stocks for about 15 years. He started young, in college, made a shitload of money in a short period of time, which then afforded him the luxury of never having to work a quote-unquote real job. Admittedly, Phil will tell you luck was a major factor early on, but nonetheless, he's been abundantly successful and has continued trading full-time, but now with a strategy, with rules, and with an edge. Phil's way of trading, just to give you a bit of an idea, is to short parabolic moves on low float stocks which have been seriously hyped up. And when he senses golden opportunities, he strikes with real conviction. In many ways, Phil is similar to Alex, who was on the previous episode, except the key difference being Alex trades the long side of these moves, whereas Phil has found his niche in trading the opposite side, the short side. As you continue listening, you'll hear Phil speak about his early days and progression, his obsession with cutting losses quickly and sizing up on those trades, which can make a good year a great year. Plus some talk about strategy, timing, setups, and why Phil is set on filtering his trading profits into farmland, which he describes as boring investments. I'm going to stop right here. Please relax and enjoy this episode with Phil Godecker. No, not a ton. Just watching. Uh, you know, we're in the midst of earnings season, so small caps are a little slow. Just watching Kodak and uh, traded a little RGSE this morning and LTBR I held overnight. But uh, that's it. O- overall, a uh, bit of a slower day. Okay. Do you have many earnings plays? Like, are they a big thing in the small cap world? No, not really. Um, I I really don't play earnings plays really much at all. But when when you have, you know, in the midst of earnings season, you just don't see small cap runners like you do, you know, like we have had the last several weeks. So, um, you know, it's just something that happens, you know, during earnings season, small caps slow down and and that's kind of the way it is. So usually just kind of uh, chill out a little bit more and take a little bit more, you know, time off, uh, you know, during those times. Right. Save your energy. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like we were speaking the other day, you, you told me that you started trading uh, while you were in college. How did that come about? You know, really, I was in, you know, high school maybe my junior, senior year. And I was kind of looking ahead to figure out what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. And, you know, the only thing I knew was that, you know, I wanted to make money. I mean, I was driven at that time. I, I, I worked, um, you know, every summer and, uh, I, the only thing I really knew was I wanted money. And I thought, well, what are the jobs out there that can provide that you can, you know, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer or, and, and those are all great, but they also come with a lot of school. And I, thought, well, I don't want to wait till I'm thirties to have money, you know, and, um, you know, or, you know, huge student loans on top of that. So, you know, it was coming across to me that, you know, if you want to work for yourself or be an entrepreneur, there's real estate or there's the stock market. And, you know, back then when I'm, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old, whatever, I thought, well, you know, real estate, you, you usually have to have money to make money and you probably have to be a little bit older, but you know, as far as the stock market goes, anybody can open up a brokerage account at any time. And 
that's when I kind of thought then, let's investigate the market a little bit. And I just started um, reading on it, studying on it, you know, just different newspapers or articles and uh, even our local business section, you know, in our local newspaper. And from then it just took off. I, I was immediately interested. I mean, it, it immediately grabbed my attention. And, um, you know, this was back in the late 90s when the stock market was roaring and you were seeing all these dot com uh, tech companies just, you know, skyrocket. And, and the whole, you know, the headlines were everybody's just making, you know, lots and lots and lots of money. So I was instantly, instantly. Attracted. Ready to go. I mean, attracted to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And what was your experience like starting out? You were, you were mostly a long trader back then, right? Yeah. So when I started out, you know, I didn't have um, everything I learned or everything I knew. I just did it on my own from, from, from doing different research. I, didn't, I had no idea shorting was even possible. So I didn't really actually open my first brokerage account. I think I was a sophomore in college and I had saved up $3,000 that I made over the summer. You know, basically at that time I was a long bias trader. I was trying to, you know, still in school. So I was swing trading, mostly trying to kind of buy breakouts and hope that I could hold them a couple days, a couple weeks and, uh, you know, kind of hope for the best. And at that time, again, I was just studying everything that I could, you know, studying, um, you know, different chart patterns, trying to find out uh, some patterns, trying to find out what made a good setup. My sophomore year in college, I just slowly lost that money. It was $3,000, and I slowly lost that over the course of the year. Well, the very next summer, I worked again. I worked for my dad. He has a business here in Missouri, and I worked for him over the summer, and I, I saved up another $3,000, and I kind of did the same my junior year. I slowly kind of lost that money, um, just trading long. You know, I couldn't find any consistency, but, you know, I was still – the losses didn't scare me at all. I was so – um, intrigued by the market, I knew there was wa- there there were ways to make money and, and ways to make big money, and I didn't have the patience to buy and hold. I just, you know, I had I, I was reading so many books in the Warren Buffett method of you know buy good companies and never ever sell them, and I thought, well, I, I just can't do that. I mean, I, I want I want money and I want it you know now. I this is what I want to do. So, um, you know, I, I never gave up. And then my senior year, I, I did the same thing. I, I saved up money over the summer. I had about $5,000. And then it was uh, right at the very start of my senior year in college, maybe around August or so, I finally found out that you could short. You know, you could bet stocks would go down. And I thought, well, hell, I'm great at that. I mean, that's what I've done the last two years. Everything I, you know, buy goes down. So, you know, at that time, you know, after studying for two years, I have seen so many patterns of stocks that have gone from five bucks to twenty bucks, or one dollar to ten dollars, or twenty to a hundred, or whatever it is. And there was a stock out there in August of my senior year of college. The symbol was Cafe C A F E. The name of the company was Host America, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. They put out a press release that they were going to do some sort of business with Walmart. And some sort of partnership with Walmart. The stock went from about four or five dollars up to fifteen dollars, and it's about a two, three day span. And I shorted it at fifteen. You know, I shorted all I all I could. It wasn't much, maybe you know, a couple thousand shares. And the very next day, the stock was halted, and it was halted for a month. And I was on Yahoo message boards, and I was reading all this stuff about oh, they're going to be bought out. And I thought, well, I'm going to be wiped out. You know, I was scared to death. And needless to say, after a month, the stock went from 15 and it opened up at five. So I had turned around $5,000 into approximately, you know, maybe $15,000. So that just, it just clicked. I mean, it opened up my eyes and it wasn't so much the monetary gain that I was excited about. I was just excited because after two years, I had finally figured out something that can work. I mean, finally it clicked. So my senior year in college, I did the same thing. I just, you know, um, shorted, you know, I guess you'd call them overhyped or overbought stocks. I hit a huge market. I mean, it was an unbelievable run in the market at that time. And from that August to when I graduated in May, I finished with about a million dollars. So I turned that 5,000 into a million right when I graduated. So um, obviously at that time I knew that, you know, yeah, I'm not, you know, I, I had studied accounting, so I graduated with accounting degree, but I thought there's no way I'm going to, I'm going to be an accountant. I mean, I, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And then, you know, I just stuck with it from there. 
That's incredible. So f- starting with $5,000 or once you refunded your account a couple times, you had a $5,000 balance and you grew that into a million dollars. What sort of time frame are we looking at? Was that about 12 months? No, that was from August to May. Uh, that was about nine months. Wow. From, from 5000 to a million dollars in nine months. And I thought I was on top of the world. I mean, from that point, it was incredible. But, you know, again, at that time, I had no rules. I had no money management. I was going all in on every position, no matter what. And that's how I grew it from 5000 to a million. I mean, there would be no way to, to, to make that return if you're not risking everything you have. Now, so needless to say, when I graduated in May, I thought, well, hell, if I had just turned 5000 into a million in nine months – in June, July, August, I want to turn that $1 million into maybe $3 million, maybe 4 And that's when I'll have some big money. Well, needless to say, the market kind of turned south, and that, that, that million went down to 500000 pretty quick. So it was August, and now I had lost 50%, and it was uh, you know quite scary. So what I did was I immediately took 400000 out. I put it in my bank account, and I thought, well, hell, this is, you know, this is savings. I'm never going to touch this. It's in the bank. And then I started trading again with 100000 and I did that um, for the next consistently for about the next three years or so. I just whatever I made at the end of every month out of a hundred grand, I just took it out, put it in the bank, took it out, put it in the bank, and then I had, you know, three pretty good years of making around a half a million dollars. You know, when I was, you know, again, I was about twenty two, twenty three, twenty four um, years old. Was there a part to this which came, which seemed kind of surreal? You know, it did. It it really did. But at the same time, I had put in so much time. You know, when I when I was in college, to be honest, I wasn't the best student. And, uh, you know, I got grades good enough just to kind of squeak by. And in every spare minute I had, I was studying the market. I mean, I really was. I was just I had stock screeners out there and I was studying every big winner for on a weekly basis, monthly basis, quarterly basis, yearly basis. I was just looking at those patterns over and over and over again until I was, you know, blue in the face. So it was surreal that I had the money, but at the same time, I had literally, I had spent thousands and thousands of hours. So the same time of it being surreal was kind of like, I mean, finally it's clicking, you know what I mean? So it it would, it, you know, finally it was making sense. And what, what was the reaction from like your friends and family when they heard about how much money you were making in the stock market? Well, to my friends, I never really disclosed it. I mean, I did have, um, you know, a house before a lot of my friends did. I actually had a vacation house and I, you know, I drove a, I had a Hummer back then, a Hummer H2. So they knew I was making money. My family, you know, was kind of, I mean, they were excited, but you know, they didn't, uh, I, I guess, they, I guess it was more of a surprise than excitement. And I did, you know, trade for my parents at the time, and I still do today. So obviously, they like to see their account go up a little bit as well. Um, but I, you know, I I was never one to go around and say, "This look what I made this year. Look what I made last week." I, you know, for the most part, I kind of kept it quiet. But I, I think everybody was kind of surprised or intrigued because, again, you'd you'd have friends that say, "Oh, well, why don't you teach me what you do so I can start it next week?" I got laid off, and it's like, oh man. I mean, it you know, it, it takes a little more than. Just uh, a, a couple drinks to explain what you do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, from the sounds of things, from a very early age, you were very motivated to make money, um, and you were kind of uh, somewhat impatient, right? Did <laughs> yeah. This, you know. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. Did this ever lead to any irrational decisions? Like when you look back on this, on those early years, did you make some pretty crazy decisions? Oh, I mean, looking back in my early years, I made every decision you could make, good, bad, irrational, um, impatient. You know, you, you know, I went through everything. I mean, I went through every failure, every high, every low that you could possibly imagine. Because again, the market's the only thing I've ever done. I have never had a job. Again, my dad owns a business in Missouri, so I've always worked a little bit on and off for him. But other than that, I have never had a job. I've done the market. From, from my sophomore year in college to today, which is um, was that 13, 14 years or something. So, um, so again, when you do something full time and you learn from your mistakes, yeah, I've been through, I have I'm not saying I've been through everything, but I've been through a lot. So I have. Uh, sure. So tell us about how you actually lost, you know, you made a million dollars and then you lost about half of it. 
How did you lose half of it? Well, again, you know, I think I was very lucky to turn 5,000 in a million. I mean, I don't think I don't even know if I could do that again today. My bet is that no, I couldn't. I couldn't replicate that. And you know, the reason being, you know, is that, you know, back then I had no rules. I would just put everything into one, uh, you know, one stock, one idea, and kind of hope that it worked. And you know, how did I lose it? It was just, you know, the market kind of turned, and you know, the good setups weren't weren't there. And and the thing is, back then. I had to be in a ticker at all times. I mean, I didn't take a day off. You know, if there was not a, uh, a top-notch setup right then and there, well, I would trade a secondary setup. I would trade a setup that I don't normally trade. I just, you know, I had to be in a, you know, a ticker at all times. And I didn't really, again, I just didn't have any rules. I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I mean, looking back from, from today to that time, I was really kind of clueless. I was lucky, you know, to be honest, I'm kind of lucky I didn't lose more. I'm lucky that I, you know, finally took a million, went down to 500. I'm lucky that I put 400 in the bank right then and there because if I would have kept going, who knows, I could have lost it all. And I could have, maybe I had to restart again at $5,000. Thank God I didn't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, having made a million dollars, that was kind of like the high point. You then lost half of it. Right. Was it ever in your mind when you were trading with a smaller account balance that you were just you were just sort of trying to get back to that million dollar mark like was that a a mental hurdle of some sort no i don't think so you know it, it took you know obviously when you when you take up a million dollars and you and you go down to 500 it, it's mentally uh, kind of demoralizing it's kind of like a you know a, a punch in the stomach and then after a couple weeks you realize, hey, I've got four hundred thousand in the bank, and I'm only twenty two years old. It's still pretty darn good. So, my point then was there, hey, let's trade with a hundred thousand dollars and let's see what I can make at the end of every single month. If I can make, you know, thirty to forty thousand dollars every single month, I mean, hell, I could, I would never have been able to get a job that could that could even remotely come close to that. So it wasn't really about getting back to a million dollars. It was about just. You know, at the end of every month, the 30th of the month, what did I make? I mean, that was my biggest goal. Let's be positive at the end of every single month, whether it's five grand, 10 grand, 50 grand. Um, so getting back to that dollar amount, I, I, it really wasn't in my mind, you know, back then. It was really just being positive and making sure that this career path I had chosen, you know, a day trader, that I could do this consistently and profitably you know, for a long period of time. That was my main focus. Okay, right. So, what have the last few years been like for you? Um, I, I guess maybe a little bit further back. So, we spoke, you know, we've been speaking about your first years in the market, but as you said, you've been trading about, I know, 12, 13, 14 years now. And I know you've been doing very well the past couple of years. What about prior to that, like kind of that in-between period? What's that been like? Yeah, so again, when I went down to 500, I immediately, like I said, put 400 in the bank, traded with 100. About the next, I would say, three to four years, I traded extremely consistent. I made about a half a million a year, where, you know, give or take, about a half a million a year. And then I was, you know, maybe 25, 26 years old. And I said, well, you know, again, I'm very happy with what I'm making, but, you know, there's got to be a way to get to the next level. I mean, what do I need to do to break out of this? I don't want to call it a rut, but again, I was very, right about that half a million dollar level. And I thought there's got to be a way to break through. So, I kind of, there was one year in there and I kind of got away from my strategy. I started to do a few other things. Uh, I got away from, I guess you'd say for my bread and butter and I started to go long more. I started to, um, you know, swing trade more. I would trade more triple leverage DTFs. You know, I was also 25 years old. I, you know, I was partying a little bit and probably wasn't concentrating as much as I should. And I did have one losing year at that time. Um, you know, I didn't lose a ton, but I did finish the year red, and that was a big wake-up call for me. I mean, I, you know, literally, I slapped myself in the face and said, "Hey, you need to get back. Don't worry about getting better than than, than where you've been the last few years. I'm mean, half a million is a hell of a lot of money. Get back to what you know. Get back to what you're good at, and stick with it." And that's what I did. You know, for for the next, you know, the next one or two years, I did. I stuck with it. Got right back, and I was still right around that, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar level. Um, and then after that, you know, I started to kind of diversify my brokers. Cause again, at this, at that time I had still really traded, I think with one broker, um, 
And I started to open up a few other brokerage accounts, put a few more money in, you know, a little bit more money into my accounts. And I started to really sit down and think about, okay, I know what my niche is at this point. You know, again, it's shorting small caps. You know, that is where I make all of my money. And I knew, okay, at that point, I'm going to stick with that. And I thought, what can I do again to, to get to the next level without, you know, revamping my whole strategy? And I thought, there's two real ways to do that. You know, again, this was when I was looking at my tax returns. I would look at my tax returns and I would see all of these you know, pretty big wins. I'd make 50 grand here, 80 grand here, 100 grand here, 20 grand here. And at the same time, I would see all these big losses, you know, lose 40 grand, lose 60 grand, lose 20 grand, lose 75,000. And I thought, well, hell, what if I just try to not even make more money, you know, not even increase my position size, not take on any more risk? What if I just try to eliminate, try my best to eliminate all of these losing trades that I have in there, all these losing setups. So again, I went back and I, you know, I studied all of my trades and I, I kind of learned that a lot of these losing setups, either A, they weren't, they just weren't the top notch setups out there, but I was still putting on, you know, maybe full position size where I just shouldn't do that. Or I was just letting losses get a little too big. I was letting those losses grow a little bit more than I should. So, you know, the very next year I said, well, hell, let me try to just cut my losses faster. You know, let me try to cut my losses faster and see what that does. And the very next year, I think I grew, you know, maybe 50 to 75%. I did that a couple of years in a row. And then, you know, again, at the same point, I started to increase my position size on what I would call, you know, I mean, maybe your golden setups, or your top notch trades, whatever they were. Um, increase my position size comfortably. And, uh, and again, that, you know, then, yeah, the next few years, my, you know, returns really grew, um, you know, quite nicely. Okay. Well, let's flesh those couple things out a little more. So you spoke about cutting losses and trading with larger size when you have a golden setup. Um, perhaps the, Actually, what might be a good thing to, to cover, first of all, before we go more into those two things, is if you could just talk a little bit about, like, what are your golden setups? Like, what are these golden opportunities that you're looking for? Like, where do you really make most of your money on what sort of opportunities? Yeah, there's there's been a couple recent ones, um, you know, in late, uh, you know, late 2017, HMNY. Um, is a great example. And that was back in, I think it was October. They went from just a couple dollars a share all the way up to, I think about $37 a share. And, um, you know, something like Riot, R-I-O-T is a blockchain play went from, you know, it was actually a, uh, I think a biotech company. They switched over to do blockchain. The stock went from, you know, sub 10 bucks all the way up to about $46. And, and I consider, you know, a lot of these moves are what I consider hype trades. There's just so much hype and, um, you know, so much hype behind them that they're, you know, they're just bubbles. So that to me would be a golden setup or something that I'm looking for to make, you know, most of my money on. Okay. And you're making it only on the short side, right? Only on the short side. Yeah. I, I would not, I don't, I don't play those long at all. They're just too risky. So, what sort of things actually drive these stocks up in the first place? Like, what's an example of, um, what was it, HMNY? Like, what was the catalyst behind that? HMNY. So, so the catalyst was MoviePass. I think they bought about a 50% uh, stake in MoviePass, which was, you know, some, um, you know, I think for 10, 12 bucks a month, you get unlimited uh, movies to a theater. And, uh, you know, I was never a a big believer in that news. I never, I never thought it was that legitimate. I thought, okay, the stock should maybe go up, you know, 50% off that news, not, you know, several hundred percent off that news. You know, these momentum names are tough because a lot of them are manipulated. You know, you need to look at the press releases. You need to see why they're moving. And you also need to, I think you need to have a firm understanding of, of level two and, a lot of these names that move, they're, they're thinly traded. You know, they have, they're low floats. You know, a lot of them trade less than 5 million shares. And they're moving because a lot of hype, I think a lot of manipulation. And, um, you know, I, I consider them a bubble. I mean, it's kind of like some of these cryptocurrencies that you're seeing moving. I mean, they're, they're just, uh, you know, there's just a lot of mania behind them. And that's how you see moves up to, 
500%, you know, 1,000%, 1,500%. Really, it's just a lot of, you know, momentum and hype. So, how come the short side presents such great profit potential for you, like as opposed to playing the long side and kind of uh, running with the hype? Well, the thing is, you never know how high they're going to go. I mean, yeah, obviously, it's easy to say, you know, if you see a stock like HMNY that goes from 5 to 37, I'd love to play that on the long side. But realistically, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that release, you know, similar type news and they don't run up a thousand percent. You know, they might run up from five bucks to six bucks or, you know, five to seven. So you never really know when those big moves are going to present themselves. You know, that's the thing. And, you know, there's always halt risk on, on a lot of these. And, you know, to me, you know, it, it all goes back to where I'm profitable as a trader. You know, again, after trading for, you know, five years or 10 years or 15 years, I think everybody should know where they're profitable. I mean, if you're profitable on the long side, then, then you could be, then, then go for that, you know, go for that strategy. You know, I'm profitable on the short side because I would rather see something that goes from five bucks to 30 bucks, know that it's overbought, you know, know that it's, you know, gonna eventually crash and fade. And I'd rather, uh, I, I just think the risk reward for me personally is much, much greater on the short side than the long side. Okay. And like you said just a couple of moments ago, you don't know how high these stocks are going to go. So how are you timing your short trades? Like how do you time this? At what point of the cycle are you getting ready to take a short? Well, the timing is very difficult. I mean, you know, HMNY, I shorted, you know, it was around maybe 850 or so, and I had about 100,000 shares short, and I cut that loss, you know, maybe high nines, you know, and I took a, you know, I took a loss on that. But, you know, a lot of these I'm taking, you know, now that one was not a paper cut loss, but a lot of these I'm taking small, what I call paper cut losses on the way up. I mean, the timing is very, very difficult because, even if you have a stock like Riot, R-I-O-T, that went up to 46, you know, if, if, if traders were to go back and look at that final day where it put up that final, final candle up to $46, I mean, those intraday swings are incredibly difficult. I mean, there are head fakes galore. You know, it, it is incredibly difficult to, to try to time that correctly. Usually what I do, again, is I'm taking paper cut losses on the upside. I'm, I'm starting with a, a starter size whether it's 5,000 shares, 10,000 shares, whatever it is. And, you know, I'm hoping that I have, you know, maybe hit the top right there and it's going to go, going to go down. If it goes down, I'm going to add, you know, if something goes up or breaks through support, I'm getting out. I mean, I'm cutting that loss, sitting back and I'm going to, I'm going to look for again, a, a re-entry either later that day or the next day or the following day or whatever that is. But I'm, I'm not a trader that's going to start a short and look to add higher. Um, I just don't do that. I did that in my younger days, but again, going back to the thought process of keeping your losses small, that just does not work of, of shorting and adding higher. I would rather short, look for a breakdown, look for a failed bounce, short that. And I want to keep adding, you know, when I'm in the money, you know, I don't want to add against me. You know, we've all seen a stock like Dry's that was last year, that was in 2016, go from $15 up to $115. So adding to a losing position is not something that I ever really want to do. Okay. So, so that's what signals that you, you may have an opportunity to enter a short is when you get a failed bounce of some sort. Yeah. Failed bounce, just a real parabolic move. I mean, usually, usually, you know, a day three of a parabolic move is, um, you know, should be uh, hopefully a winning entry. But again, entries are tough. I mean, on these parabolic moves that are low float, that are highly manipulated, I mean, trust me, I have, I mean, it, it is extremely aggravating. I mean, I, I have no, you know, I have no miracle uh, work entry. I, I just don't. I mean, it is extremely, extremely tough. I am usually, you know, again, I am taking lots of small losses on these before I finally try to nail it. Uh, you know, on the downside, but it, it is certainly, it, it is certainly not easy. The other thing I, I really pay a lot of attention to is volume. You know, on my charts, when I'm, when I'm looking at charts, the only things I really use are price and I use volume. Sometimes I, I do use VWAP, but you want to look at volume and also level two to see what's going on there. I mean, when you see a big drop on heavy volume, 
you know, that's usually a key to me that, hey, this, this could be the end or this could be the exit. You know, somebody big is getting out. You know, that's, that's one of the, the main indicators that I will look at. Okay. So let's talk about how you're actually cutting losses. So you say that you're cutting losses fairly quickly, you know, if, if things don't start to move in your favor. Can you just go into that a little more? Like at what point would you say that the trade is not going against you and you need to, you need to cut this trade? Um, because, you know, we often hear, you know, it's good to cut your losses quickly and that, but when you actually put that into action, it can be a little more difficult than it is to talk about. Sure. Yeah. Well, it really comes down to the price action for that day. I mean, let's say, let's say you've had a stock that's gone from maybe $5 to $30 and you think that 30 is a good entry. Um, you know, you short it at, you know, it's up to 30, it falls to 29, 70, 29, 80, and, and you enter right there and you have a short, it drops a little bit to 29, 50. I mean, usually my point is I'm going to use kind of, um, I guess you could say a resistance exit, you know, and, and if 30 was the high of the day, you know, you maybe give it a little bit more than that, but basically it's based off the chart. I mean, my trading is, I would say, you know, 80 to 90% technical analysis and, and, and looking at the chart and reading the chart, looking at the volume. And, um, you know, it's based off that. And, and, and that takes, you know, to be honest, that takes a while to figure that out. It took me a long, long, long time. And I'm still trying to, I'm not saying perfect technical analysis at all, but a lot of it is just looking at support, looking at resistance. And if it breaks, if I'm short and something breaks through resistance and, and definitely if it breaks through resistance on volume, I'm just going to cut that loss. I mean, it's just as simple as that. I, I, um, I, I try my hardest not to fight anything. I don't want to get emotional. I never want to say, Hey, this can't go higher. I mean, it's impossible. It can't go higher. It's so overbought. This news is BS. If something doesn't act right, and it breaks that resistance. I just, I'm just out. How many times are you willing to be wrong on a particular move? Well, I've never given up on a move. I mean, never. I mean, you know, I have never been really with a stock and said, well, it's just going up too much. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm just going to completely take it off my radar. Now, you know, going back to like HM and Y, I originally shorted that, like I said, in the eights, I cut it in the high nines and it took, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going off memory here, but it probably took two or three weeks for it to get back into the thirties where I finally reshorted it. So there are times where, you know, I will get out. It'll take, you know, several more weeks for maybe the pattern to complete itself before I will get back in. But rarely is, you know, rarely is there a time out there where I just, you know, I'll never just give up. But, you know, sometimes you just have to be patient for the entire move to, um, you know, for the entire move to happen before, you know, before you get back in it, before the timing is right, I should say. This episode of Chat with Traders is backed by Robin Hood. No doubt many of you already know about Robin Hood, but if not, Robin Hood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks and options for free. Yeah, Robin Hood doesn't charge any commissions. You can now hold on to all of your trading profits. Plus, there is no account minimum deposit, meaning you can start investing at any level. And on top of this, the Robinhood app is really intuitive. The simple design makes it easy for anyone to understand and easy to place trades. But here's the really cool part. Robinhood is giving listeners of Chat With Traders podcast a free stock like Apple, Ford or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. Sign up at traders.robinhood.com. Again, you can sign up at traders.robinhood.com. This episode is also brought to you by the Venetian Las Vegas. The Venetian, of course, features all suite accommodation in the heart of the Las Vegas Strip. While it's world-renowned as a truly iconic hotel and casino with a stunning five-acre pool and garden deck, four theatres and such, it's also home to 160 retail shops within the Grand Canal shops, showcasing the likes of Barney's New York, Louis Vuitton, etc. The Venetian is also home 
to restaurants of celebrated chefs, one of them being the cake boss, Buddy Velastro. Plus, the Venetian has plenty to offer you in terms of entertainment, with Baz, a musical mashup, Human Nature Jukebox, if that's what you're into, and Classic Rock Residencies. For more information, visit venetian.com. The Venetian Las Vegas, where you can come as you are. Now, the other thing you had brought up was like like having conviction on your really good setups. So trades which look very promising, you want to hit those with as much real size as you can. I'd like to hear a bit more about how you think about this type of thing because you know, what signals to you that this particular trade might be better than these last few trades? Like, yeah, let's hear a little more about that. So I guess it all goes back to finding your niche as a trader. I'm not trying to get sidetracked here, but I think, you know, you know, the great thing about being a trader, the great thing about trading is that you can make money doing so many different things, going long, going short, you know, day trading, swing trading, you know, trading options, trading stocks. So I think it's so important that we, we find our niche, you know, we find what we're good at. We don't have to be good at everything. <laughs> you know, we can just be good at one thing and, you know, we can make a ton of money just being good at one thing. So on the short side, or for me, finding that one thing is, is, is a parabolic setup. And again, what is a parabolic setup? Well, it's something that moves, you know, I'm going to say, you know, usually it's several hundred, maybe a thousand percent on news that is just, you know, that it just doesn't justify it. So, you know, again, after trading for several years, this is something that, you know, is probably not for a beginner, but after trading for several years or hitting, you know, again, no matter what your strategy is, you should see setups out there that you can know, okay, nine out of 10 times, I'm going to be profitable on this setup or nine, 95% of the time, I'm going to be profitable on the setup. So obviously the risk reward is such in your favor on those setups, why would you not want to put as much money you, as you can behind that trade? I mean, it's just, it's just simple. You know, something, you know, again, for me, something like an HMNY in the 30s or a riot in the 40s or a year ago, we had ETRM that ran from a few bucks all the way up to $30 a share. I mean, there are just such huge, you know, pockets of air in these stocks that for me, it, it, it's it's a twofold. I mean, yeah, A, it's about the money because <laughs> I like to make money. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for. But B, it's also about kind of, I don't know if it's feeding your hunger inside or your, your need or your want. It's just like, you know, you see these setups and I know that, I mean, I just know they're going to crash. I mean, but again, it's like we talked about a couple minutes ago. It's the timing. It's the timing that's difficult. So I think as traders want to get to the next level or take things to the next level, you know, it's always best to a study your trades, know where you're making money. No, you know, you can say without, you know, a shadow of a doubt, Hey, 99 out of 10 times on this setup, I'm going to be profitable or 95% of the time I'm going to be profitable. And if you have odds like that, you know, you don't see odds like that in the stock market all the time. Right. I mean, but if you have odds like that, why would you not want to put as much money as you can behind that trade? I mean, obviously with a type stop, tight stop loss, like we've mentioned, but, you know, when I see those setups out there, it's hard for me even to sleep at night. I mean, I'm so excited. I'm up very early in the morning, ready to, you know, ready to try to hit those moves because again, they don't happen all the time. I mean, these setups are not something that's going to happen every day. You might have them three times a year, four times a year, five times a year, six times a year, whatever it is. But even for me, you know, at this point in, um, in my trading career, when I go back at the end of every single year and I look at all of my wins and all of my losses, these, you know, riots, RIOT and HMNY and, and maybe XNET, you know, these type of moves are going to make me, you know, they're going to account for maybe, you know, 75 to 80% of my income. So I know that this is where I'm going to make the big money. For me personally, the big money, the big money is going to be in the big moves. And, and the rest of the stuff day to day is just kind of scalping, uh, I'm trading more of smaller size, medium size, and just trying to, you know, kind of scalp some trades. Okay. But your niche is shorting these, these parabolic moves, right? Right. Correct. Yep. So that's pretty much your thing. That's what you do. 
what makes you know one what makes one trade different from the next like how do you know that this this particular setup this what i'm seeing right here this is a trade that i need to trade with much larger size as opposed to the last one like before these big moves actually unfold what gives you the conviction that you really need to hit this particular one with a lot more size right well it really comes down to if it's a multi-day runner or a multi-week runner or um you know maybe a multi-month runner i mean it, it really comes down to how much how high is the stock how high is the move you know i mean that's what it's going to come down to if something is a day one runner and it's only up you know 30 40 maybe 50 percent well obviously i'm not going to put my whole account behind that move you know if we have something that over the course of three or four or five weeks has gone from, you know, or even, even, even five days. I mean, it's gone from three or $4 up to 20, 30, 40, $50. Basically it's the, the, the higher it goes, the more conviction I'm going to have that it's going to fall. I mean, again, like I said, we talked about a little bit ago, I'm probably 80% at least technical, uh, technical bias, but the other 20% is fundamentals. And you want to know why that move, why, why is that move occurring? Um, so, you know, the fundamentals are going to come, come in there as well, but you know, overall, you know, my conviction, how do I know I'm going to put this much money behind this trade is, it, you know, how high is it? How much air is in that stock? How manipulated is it? How much, uh, you know, how high has the move gone? I guess overall, I mean, something that has gone from three to 30, I'm going to put a heck of a lot more money in something that's gone from three to 30 than I am stock that's only gone from three to four. I mean, there's just not. There's just not that much meat on the bone, I guess you could say. Okay. I like your analogy of, of a stock having more air in it. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, again, you know, I have – so something I've done since I've started trading, I've gotten a little lazy because I have two kids. But after trading for 10, 12 years, what I do is I try to at the end of every single year go back and print out a chart – of that year's biggest winners, you know, stocks that have gone from five to 50 or five to 15, you know, three to 30, whatever it is. And I print out every chart and every single one of these falls right back to earth. I mean, almost every single one of these after hitting a peak is going to fall, you know, 40, 50, 60, maybe 70%. So I print out all of these charts and I keep them handy so I can go back and I can, you know, uh, maybe compare one move to another move. And I do. I call them pockets of air because I, I honestly, I don't remember one of these ever really holding up long term. I mean, they're all going to crack. And that's what I'm looking for. Some of them hold up longer than others. Some of them go a lot further than others. Like, like we talked about dries, you know, going from five to 115. But at the end of the day, every one of these low float um, I call them hype trades. Most of them are manipulated. Um, you know, they're just momentum plays. I mean, literally, I cannot remember one that that has not crashed. So yeah, I do. I call them. They just have you know pockets of air in there that it's like a balloon just waiting for a, a needle to prick it. And once it happens, it's like bam. I mean, they 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 fall, you know, so hard so fast that. Uh, you know, again, that's what keeps me in the game, just looking for that next move, that next setup. <laughs> so as you, when you get a good entry on a trade and it starts to move in your favor, are you adding size as it breaks down? Yeah, usually I am. I mean, that's, that's when I'll, you know, again, I like to be in the money when I'm, when I'm adding. I mean, now again, I don't want to chase. I mean, if I can, I, 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 you know, I try to do whatever I can not to chase as much as possible, but you know, on these um, thinly traded momentum stocks, you know, from what we've seen is that when when it's the end, it, it, it can end pretty darn fast and you can have some downside pretty quick, pretty fast. So, yeah, usually it's on the downside that I'm, you know, that I'm getting in and I'm slamming that bid and I'm, uh, you know, adding adding size to it. Okay. And what about holding positions overnight? Can you um, add a bit of color to that? Again, it comes down to you know how overbought the stock is that I'm trading. Something that's a multi-week runner, you know, I'm going to hold that overnight. Sometimes for weeks on end. I mean, I might hold it two weeks. I might hold it three weeks. 
Are you ever worried about overnight risk? Like, is that something you try to mitigate at all? Yeah, I mean, it is. It depends what I'm trading. I mean, usually if I'm trading something garbage, the only overnight risk you're going to have is a PR. And and, and you do want to know, you know, it all depends on the setup. I mean, every setup is different. If I have something like Riot or, or HMNY or, you know, ETRM a year ago or, um, you know, there's so many others. If, if it has run its course, I'm going to hold that overnight and I'm going to have, you know, zero problem holding that overnight. You know, if something just popped up day one and it went from two to 250 or two to three and you think there could be more PRs in the future, you know, the next couple of days, then yeah, I'm not going to hold much overnight and I'm not going to hold, if I do, I'm not going to hold much size overnight because, you know, when you have something low float, you know, a million shares, two million shares, three million shares, and your stock is, you know, just a couple bucks. I mean, there definitely is real risk to holding those overnight. You know, we saw with KBIO, I think that was three years ago, you know, KBIO filed for bankruptcy and the stock was around, I'm going to say around $2. And I think when they liquidated, I think they had enough assets, I think for around 75 cents a share. So I was short. I know a lot of people were short. And I was short, you know, decent size because the float at that time, you know, again, it's about three years ago. I think it was about three million shares. And then, you know, overnight, Martin Shrelly said, or it was announced, you know, through Form 4s that he had bought maybe 75% of the company. And that stock went from a closing price of around two to the next day it opened, um, God, I forgot exactly where it opened, maybe 10, 12 bucks. And within a couple of days, it was up to 40. So, you know, you definitely need to, you know, be very cautious holding these overnight and, you know, you need to know, you know, the real story behind them, you know, something that's low float, cheap stock with a low float, you know, it can be dangerous to hold them overnight. I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of traders blow up making mistakes like that. So you definitely need to, you know, proceed with caution, I'll say. Do you ever feel comfortable in these big trades? Do I ever feel comfortable? Oh, I yeah. I mean, you know, I would say, and again, it's waiting for the backside of the move. I mean, that's the most difficult thing out there is waiting for the backside. Again, it's the same thing as we try, you know, talked about a few minutes ago is, is timing it right. When do you time these shorts and when do you get in with size? It's the backside. I mean, that's when you want to do it. So when a move has hit the backside, I would say, you know, the, 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 the upward move is done. It's hit its exhaustion. It's coming down. It's the backside of the move rarely then do I get nervous. I mean, rare, you know, usually then it's, you know, you're breathing a sigh of relief. You're saying, you know, yeah, I'm going to nail this. I mean, you know, you're, <laughs> you know, pretty excited. So on the backside of the move, I'm, I'm rarely uncomfortable with my trading. The only time I'm uncomfortable is if I don't have enough size on, you know, if, if I didn't get enough shares and I can't locate shares anywhere, then I'm, then I'm almost angry. You know, I want to add more size to these, but um, I, you know, I try to, you know, I try to um, have enough caution out there that I don't play too much size on the front side of a move ever. I'm really waiting for the backside. I'm waiting for the downside, the backside, whatever you want to call it. And then once that happens, I'm I'm good. I'm you know I'm I'm feeling good, and I'm you know know that the move you know should be over at that point. This might be a little bit of a silly question, but I'm curious to hear what you you say anyway. Trading the size that you are trading, you know, when you get these golden opportunities and your experience, your knowledge of, you know, level two, the order book, and because these stocks that you're trading are low floats, are you ever able to kind of bully the price a little bit? Well, you mean, do I ever try to manipulate or do I ever manipulate it or do I do do my orders just move it is what you're saying? Well, I wasn't going to use the word manipulate. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, um, no, I, I will say that your orders do move the stock. I mean, yeah, I've placed, you know, a lot of times, you know, I have traded with traders, um, good short sellers, you know, will have a big front side of the move, stock up 200%, 300%, 400%, and they'll say, you know, the, the, the downside will start and it'll, it'll happen faster than any of us think. And they'll say, Oh, that just missed my entry by five cents or missed my entry by 10 cents. And I say, well, shit, it didn't miss my entry. Cause I slammed the bid. I mean, I slam it over and over and over again and I have no problems taking liquidity. And yeah, on something low float, if I'm slamming the bid, I will, I will 
you know, I, I will, you'll definitely see that. I mean, you'll definitely see on something low float that I'm moving the stock. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Do I ever get in and try to play games on level two? No. I mean, I've, you know, I've probably, you know, I've placed a few orders in my time and, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't really mess around with that too much. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think you may have mentioned this a little earlier, but this going really big on certain trades as opposed to other trades when you think that you have a golden setup, a golden opportunity, would you advise that this is something for slightly more experienced traders? Like it's not really something you should be doing if this is your first year of trading. Is that a, a fair statement? Well, yeah. And I think in your first year of trading, I don't know that you're going to know what your golden setups are. Again, because you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the market that you know, the market's difficult, right? I mean, 90 to 95% of traders fail. And, you know, I think, why do they fail? They fail because they lose money. I mean, they lose too much money. They don't fail because they don't make money, but, you know, they fail because they lose money. And, you know, they fail because maybe they don't have their niche. Maybe they, 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 they you know, we follow people on Twitter that, that tweet, you know, all these new ideas every 30 seconds long and short and swing trade and day trade and a buyout opportunity or whatever it is. And, you know, I think if you're especially in your first year or you're just starting out in a couple of years, I would say, you know, number one, find your niche, you know, find what you're good at and then try to perfect that. Now, after you've perfected that, maybe you can try to move on to something else. But um, yeah, I would say it's going to be very hard to, you know, add to your, your top setups until you at least know what they are. And then after you know what they are, I would say you can definitely add to them, but do it with appropriate size. So if you're used to putting on maybe $50,000 positions, and and you have a top setup. Well, maybe add this. Maybe put on a sixty or seventy thousand dollar position. You know, don't just go from fifty thousand position to a five hundred thousand dollar position or whatever it is. You know, add accordingly. You know, increase your size maybe ten to fifteen percent. You know, if those work, and you know you're still making money consistently on these top setups, we'll increase to twenty five percent, thirty percent. You know, fifty percent. Whatever it is, take it slow. Take it in stages. And then, you know, and then go from there. Mm. Yeah. Um, and just going back to another thing you said uh, earlier on, uh, multiple brokers, can you just um, shine a little light on why you are trading through multiple brokers? Like, why do you have all these various accounts? Sure. Yeah, I, I trade with probably, you know, uh, uh, seven, eight brokers. I mean, for for a couple of reasons. It depends, I guess, whether you're a long base, long biased trader or short biased. If you're a long bias trader, I don't really know that I see a reason to, to have more than one broker. I mean, for ease of use and ease of purpose. Now, a, a short seller is, is is a lot different. You know, number one, your broker has to have the shares. And the stuff that I'm trading, the low floats that I'm trading, well, a lot of brokers don't have them. I mean, so the more brokers you have, the more uh, the increase, uh, the amount of chances that you're going to get those shares. I mean, that's that's the main reason right there. The second reason is one broker might have something easy to borrow. And um, well, if one broker has it easy to borrow, they don't have to pay for locates. You know, different brokers will also charge different fees to either locate these stocks or to hold these stocks short overnight. So um, having multiple brokers on the short side is really, like I said, two-faceted. You know, number one, to try to get that locate. And number two, try to decrease your fees because as a short seller, Something you have to think about are fees. I mean, short locate fees are extremely, extremely high. Short interest is extremely high, and these overnight um, charges are, you know, I mean, they they they're going to take at least 10, 15, maybe more percent of your, you know, percent of your trading profits. Yeah, and I guess maybe if you want to throw in a third reason, it probably mitigates your risk a little bit as well. You know, in case one broker, you know, touch wood goes down. Right. Sure. All your capital is not tied up. Well, and it also, again, um, like you said, mitigates the risk for, for that reason or for another reason in case you get a margin call. I had an instance where I was actually long uh, GBTC, which is a, um, it's a, it, you know, it's a Bitcoin ETF about you know, several weeks ago when it dipped down to 1100. And, and one of my brokers that I went long in, I had no idea it wasn't marginable. So the next day I had a, a monster margin call. So that broker was down for the day. And I had a wire in from another broker. So yeah, the, you, know, I, you know, I would always advise having even if you're long biased, having two brokers is never going to hurt you. But if you're short biased, yeah, I would say, you know, the more brokers you can have, the better. You know, if you're just getting started out, 
you know, it, it's not really wise to do that because you, you may not have the funds for it. But once you get a little more advanced, it, it helped my trading dramatically, you know, to have more brokers and fewer. Okay. Yeah, cool. So I was reading through your 2017 review and there was an interesting comment you made towards the end where you spoke about some of the things you do with your trading profits uh, outside of the market. So can you tell us a little bit about what some of those things are and your thoughts around that? Yeah. So again, being that I've traded for uh, 13, 14 years, I have been around several other good traders that have blown up. I mean, several traders that have traded five years or 10 years or 15 years and, and one mistake or two mistakes and they're gone. You know, that's the thing about trading is you never know that one instance or two instances or, or whatever it is where you could, you know, you could just, you know, you could just blow up. You could make a couple mistakes like dries or KBIO or whatever it is and you just get stubborn and you're done. So, you know, I think it's so great to have a backup plan. I mean, have a backup plan, have money elsewhere. And it doesn't really matter where it is. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's in the bank. It doesn't matter whether it's in CDs. It doesn't matter whether you invest in real estate. I mean, I choose to, you know, obviously, I mean, I do have a 401k. My wife and I both do. So we max that out every single year. And then I started, you know, just buying land in Missouri, farmland in Missouri. That is, um, to be honest, it's a very boring investment. I mean, it, it, you probably couldn't get more boring than just buying farmland. But but over the last hundred years or so in the Midwest, land is appreciated at least around four to five percent a year. And then we get, you know, cash rent. You know, I, we rent that out to farmers and we make another five to six percent a year. And the reason that I chose farmland, you know, obviously I try to keep money in the bank and I try to put money away in the bank every single month, every single quarter, whatever it is. But when that money is accessible to me, I always find something else to put it in. You know, I always find something that's high risk. I mean, even though I've been trading the market, I've had success, it's still very high risk. I mean, at the end of the day, it's very high risk. So I like to get that money almost out of my hands, pay for land, and then I can't touch it. I mean, that money is there. It's safe. It's not going anywhere. It's extremely boring, yes, but it's almost, you know, the exact opposite of what I do on a daily basis, which is, you know, again, it's just very risky. So, you know, again, as traders, the longer we trade and the older we get, I think the less Maybe I don't want to say the less able we would be able to go get another job, but I, I couldn't imagine what would happen to me if I blew up tomorrow and I have to go get a job again. I've never had a job. I've never done anything outside of maybe work for my, my, my family's business a little bit and then trade. So that's why I personally, it makes me sleep better at night knowing that, you know, one day, I mean, obviously I think, well, maybe I'll retire one day, even though I love the markets, but whether you retire or whether you blow up or whether you just want some time off, no matter what it is, you have... Uh, another avenue out there, another revenue stream um, out there to support you if you need it. Yeah, I think that's that's a smart move for sure. I'm just curious why you gravitated towards farmland as opposed to, you know, more traditional forms of real estate like buying rental properties and that sort of thing. Oh, I've done that. I've, I've owned lots of rental properties and they were just, you know, I first owned rental properties um, in St. Louis. I've owned them at um, another you know, location in Missouri, kind of a vacation uh, destination in Missouri. And it just turned out to be a big pain in the butt. I mean, <laughs> you know, tenants, I've had, I've had tenants, nightmare tenants. Um, and then I got property managers. I mean, I thought, well, hell, I've got a property manager to deal with these people. Well, the property managers couldn't deal with them. I had a deal, you know, I found out that instead of managing the tenants, I was managing the property managers and I was having to talk to them on a daily basis, whether they had dogs, whether they, you know, were partying, whether they weren't paying their rent on time, whether they were trashing the place. I mean, and then I had to repair the roof, had to fix the HV. I mean, at the end of the day, I wanted a side investment that was, that didn't take away my time or efforts from the market. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, my market is my main focus. My market will always be the main focus. So I wanted this investment to be something that A, I couldn't touch, you know, it was just completely safe and I couldn't touch the money, but B, it didn't take up time. I mean, it didn't take up time or energy or focus. And that's, again, that's why, you know, the returns for farmland, yeah, they probably are a little bit lower than, than I could get elsewhere, but they also take up, I mean, they are, they are literally zero stress, zero time and zero maintenance. I mean, I, it's just a raw piece of land that a farmer, you know, farms at every year. You couldn't ask for anything easier or lower maintenance than that. Yeah. No, that's a great point you make, actually, you know, being very mindful about where your time has been spent, you know, because right. if you're starting to manage people and that sort of thing, it can be a great distraction, right? 
Yeah. I mean, again, you know, I knew, you know, when I had, you know, owned apartment buildings, I owned, you know, several buildings and several um, condos that were rentals. And, you know, it's fun knowing that you own these. But at the end of the day, if it's taken away from your main revenue stream, I thought, well, why the hell am I doing this? I mean, I'm not in this to be a real estate investor. I mean, I'm a day trader. And I just want something on the side. Well, it was kind of to the point where I'm getting phone calls during market hours. And, and I thought, well, hell, this is taken away from my main my main gig. That's not what I wanted. And that's why I, you know, I sold all those and I looked for something different. Yeah. Well, Phil, I have to say it's been a, a real pleasure to have you on the podcast. And I'm very grateful that you agreed to do this. So I just want to say thank you very much. Sure. I appreciate you, you having me on. And I hope, um, you know, I hope that I can you know, help some people out there. I hope my interview uh, helps some people make some money. I have no doubt. Now, if someone wants to find out a little more about you, I know you don't have a great presence online besides Twitter. Um, what is your Twitter handle? Ozark Trades. Okay. And that is spelled O-Z-A-R-K Trades, correct? Trades, yep. That's correct. Yep. Cool. All right, Phil, once again, got to say, thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate it. Yep, appreciate it, Aaron. Thank you, sir. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. 